Hi, welcome to chapter four. In this chapter, we're going to be discussing emotions and moods. So what we're going to be discussing in this chapter, we're going to be looking at uh, differentiating between emotions and moods and defining them and talking about what they are. Discussing whether emotions have a place in the, in the, in the work environment and how they can affect uh, people's behaviors, attitudes, job satisfaction, job performance. We're going to look at potential sources of emotion and moods. Uh, we're going to talk about emotional labor and define what emotional labor is. We're going to talk about emotional intelligence and define what emotional intelligence is. We're going to look at the AET, which is the Effective Events Theory and its applications. We're going to identify uh, emotional regulation and talk about what that is and how what the effects of that are and apply concepts about emotions and moods to organizational behavior in general. So originally emotions were excluded from organizational behavior study. Why? Because historically emotions uh, in the workplace are thought to be detrimental. They were thought to be something that uh, could be harmful. Uh, managers tried to create emotion-free organizations. So they didn't want people to display or express their emotions in the work environment. And therefore it wasn't worthy to study. Uh, the thinking has changed. Emotions uh, have been recognized to be a significant contributor to enhancing or, or hindering performance. And they have um, a huge impact on how the employees treat each other, treat subordinates, treat superiors, and treat customers and other um, stakeholders in the business. So affect emotion and mood. So let's look at this, these three uh, events. So we know, let's just start with um, effect. So effect is, describes a broad range of feelings that people experience and effect can be experienced in the form of emotions and mood. So effect is basically the initial feelings that get expressed as your emotion or your mood. So effect is a general term that covers a broad range of feelings people experience. Um, and of course, including emotions and moods, which we're going to talk about. Emotions are intense feelings that are directed at someone or something, while moods are feelings that intend to be less intense than emotions and lack that contextual stimulation. So let's look at emotions over here. So um, these could be caused by particular events. They could be brief in duration or lengthy. They um, generally most moods don't don't last longer than a day. Um, specifics uh, specific and numerous in nature. Uh, we all know the the gamut of emotions such as uh, being upset, to sadness, to happiness, to being excited, surprised, to disgust, angry, fearful. Um, and emotions can be generally expressed through body language and facial expressions and can be seen through certain actions, especially verbal communication. Now moods, uh, it's unclear exactly what causes a mood. Sometimes moods come and go. You're in a good mood, you're in a bad mood, you're not exactly sure why. Um, they generally are formed, you're either in a good mood or a bad mood, which would cause a positive mood or a negative mood. Um, and these two are not always indicated by distinct expressions or body language they are more subtle, uh, they're more cognitive in nature. Okay, so the basic emotions, let's look at the six universal emotions. If we were to put all the emotions into six categories, we would call them um, anger, fear, sadness, happiness, disgust, and surprise. So many researchers agree on these six basic emotional fields. Uh, some even plot them against a continuum, happiness, sadness, fear, I'm sorry, it would start with happiness, then surprise, fear, sadness, anger, and disgust at the bottom. The closer the two emotions are to each other in the continuum, the more likely people will confuse them one for the other. Okay. Uh, let's talk about the basic moods, positive and negative. So there are two basic moods, either you're feeling good or bad, positive or negative, uh, and these could be expressed uh, in different ways. So generally your, your mood is, is not really expressed as neutral. Um, 
and emotions are grouped uh, into general mood states. So there are the positive or good emotions, and then there are negative or bad emotions. So a positive effect, uh, uh, a mood dimension consisting of positive emotions such as excitement, enthusiasm, elation, um, and, and and the high positive effect. But there's also, you can think of boredom, depression, fatigue uh, at the low or low positive effect. Now the negative effect, these are a mood dimension consisting of nervous, nervousness, stress, anxiety at the high end, and at the low end, calmness, serenity, um, and these were, these are, so it's important to understand how these are grouped. Uh, there's a, a high and a low effect, and sometimes some people will, in the, in the low effect on the positive negative, some people may get confused that they think that depression uh, or fatigue should be a negative effect, but actually is a positive, but a low positive. And we look more at calmness and serenity to be a low negative. So I know it's not that intuitive, but that's sort of how uh, the researchers classify these moods. So how do we experience moods and emotions? So positive moods are somewhat more common than negative moods. Thank God, right? <laughs> it's better that we're in more of a positive state the majority of the time than a negative state. So, um, and hopefully people are, are experiencing at least a mildly positive mood at most times. The, so the degree to which people experience positive and negative emotions varies, I guess, across culture. Some cultures value certain emotions more than others, which lead individuals to change their perspective on experiencing those emotions and can lead to confusion when you're going between different cultures where it's okay to express one mo emotion quite freely in other cultures it may not be okay to express that emotion so let's talk about the functions of emotions and moods so uh, there are some who think that emotions are linked to being irrational and expressing emotions in public may be damaging to your career or status. So a lot of times the expression of emotions makes people feel that you're an erratic person, a rational person, crazy person. However, research has shown that emotions are necessary for rational thinking. So for you to think rationally, you have to feel. Um, you have to, and the more in touch you are with your feelings and moods, the more you can process what's happening. People who are behaving ethically are at least uh, partially making decisions based on their emotions and their emotions and feelings. So if you're behaving ethically, that means that you recognize when you're doing something wrong or you recognize when something is unfair. Uh, so emotions can help us make or help us to make better decisions and help us to understand the world around us. So if we're going to make decisions, we need to incorporate both thinking and feeling together. So the, the so you can kind of think of emotions as moods as giving you a centering of, or an expression of things you're going through, things you're feeling, things you're experiencing. So your mind has a way of making you feel, you may not be able to actually think constructively or accurately of what's happening or make sense of it, but emotions are there to sort of kind of nudge you or guide you to say, uh, this is how you're feeling and you're feeling it and that's when you should take pause and think about why am I feeling this, what's causing me to feel this way. And for some people, what they're feeling is not a direct correlation to what they're actually experiencing. They could be deferring um, or displacing their emotions from a, a previous event to their current event. You know, re-expressing emotions that weren't previously dealt with or expressed um, and transferring them to other events. And that could be uh, dangerous in your relationships as well as the work environment. Okay. Uh, source of emotions and mood. So, um, so people experience both positive and negative emotions, and some people experience them more deeply than others. Uh, many are happier towards the end of their, their week or midday, and so people, uh, of course, experience moods and emotions for many different reasons. So one of them is, you know, personality has an effect too. So some people, their personality will affect how their moods are displayed or how they feel them, or how they change. Um, and intensity, people feel in their emotions in different intensity levels. And the more intense you're feeling in your emotions, the more you may be expressing or reacting to them. 
people will vary in their moods and their in their emotional responses based on the time of day uh, and based on the day of the week so most people have the monday blues and the friday joys uh time of the day some people are don't have better worse moods in the morning and then better moods after they have a cup of coffee or a break or closer to when work is ending. And also moods can be affected by what people eat. So uh, if you have a poor diet or if you're certainly, if you're hungry, that's gonna affect your mood. We even have a series of commercials, these Snicker commercials where a person is acting like somebody else, they eat a Snickers and then they're, they're set themselves again. It's a pretty popular commercial. I'm sure you've seen it. Uh, so, you know, so uh, food, family life, in environmental um, can all affect how people, how people are feeling in their emotions. Now, here are some uh, charts. These are also in the textbook that if you look at the time of day, so we have a level of pop positive effect and level of negative effect. You can see that if we're looking at day of the week and time of the day, there are fluctuations that people and, and their feelings based on um, and we've ha had people describe themselves as a morning person, so maybe they feel better in the morning. And so, so each person is different, but generally if we were gonna map out um, the, the daily time effect for adults, these were some research was done on that. Uh, if we look at the, if we look at the day of the week and we can look at across cultures, we can see a difference between Sunday, Monday, Friday, and Saturday between USA, China, Germany, and Japan. So the level of positive and negative effects are different, uh, especially if you look at um, differences between culture, you can quite visibly see here in these two graphs of positive and negative emotion. Now, other sources of emotion And some of these we can consider illusionary correlation, meaning that there's really no scientific proven correlation, but we feel that there's a there's a, a correlation between the two. Now, weather is thought to have an impact on our emotions, but it's not a proven effect. It's what we call illusionary correlation. So if we're, no one's ever been able to prove it, but we all basically feel that if we wake up and it's a nice sunny day, we're all like, yay, I feel great. And if you wake up and it's cold and raining, you're supposed to impact your mood. But there are some people who say, I only feel happy when it rains. There's actually a song about it. So there's really no evidence here. But I think we all have an opinion on this. Stress is another important factor. And even at low levels, it can cause a change in mood. And you can see this when you're driving. Everybody driving, everything's fine. You're singing to a song and then someone cuts you off or you, you miss a traffic, the, red, the, the light turns red and you have to stop and suddenly your mood, you're, you're angry or upset. So stress is definitely a factor. It's important to maintain low levels of stress to help us control our psychological as well as physical health. So stress is something that we need to fight against. We need to really manage our stress, recognize our stress, develop strategies to alleviate our stress because it will kill us. It will make our lives hell and miserable. So stress is something we really have to fight against because of the effect it has on our moods and our health. Uh, social activities have been shown to have positive impacts on our moods. Um, this could be physical outlets such as playing sports or it could be uh, going out to dinner with friends and these types of activities are found to have a positive impact on our moods now also um, if you think about sleep that's a another factor it is important um, to get enough sleep i think we all feel that way and i think you know uh, having l uh, less sleep does make us crankier does it make us more uh, prone to fly off the handle, makes uh, we're not as good as making decisions, and it increases our negative emotions. So it's always good to have a good night's rest. All right. Okay, even more sources. Exercise. Uh, so physical activities definitely have a chemical, proven chemical ability to um, manage and elevate our moods. Age. Um, Hopefully as we age, we get more experience in dealing with our emotions uh, and, and hopefully better able to regulate our emotions. So that's why they, some research shows that older people experience negative emotions less. Um, 
though some characteristics are beyond our control, um, can impact our moods. And like age and gender would be two aspects of that. Um, women tend to express their emotions uh, readily and their moods tend to last longer, according to research. And research has shown that uh, this is due to more cultural uh, socializations and biology. So it's not a biological issue, it's more the culture that may put additional stresses uh, on women and can tend to um, exacerbate some of their emotions. Now, these are my personal opinions. These are based on research or uh, in organizational behavior area. So, uh, but we could all understand that what we do as a person um, is going to affect our emotions and how we're treated as a, pro a person through either society, work culture, or through family is also going to affect our emotions greatly. Now, if we talk about emotional labor, uh, this is an ability um, that you're expending effort to uh, organize and express your emotions based on what's kind of required at work. So in, in many jobs, there is an, an agreement, an implied agreement on the types of emotion that should be expressed. You know, for example, uh, waitress, uh, waiters or waitresses are supposed to be friendly and more cheerful when they greet customers and they are currently feeling, you know. So you, if, you're, if you're, say, uh, a waiter or a waitress, you're supposed to project a positive, happy, go-lucky attitude, helpful attitude, even when you really want to perhaps uh, kill the person you're waiting on because they sent the steak back three times. Uh, and then you also, when employees don't feel the emotion they're required to express, uh, they may exper experience what's emotional dissonance, which can lead to a burnout or frustration in the job. So let's kind of discuss these two elements again. Now, emotional labor is basically there's an effort that you have to put in place to express to to express the proper emotions that you're supposed to express at work. So you sometimes have to hide what you're truly feeling and put on a happy face, or you may not like something what a coworker is saying and you really want to get angry, but you have to hold that anger back and talk uh, constructively. Now, emotional dissonance is when an employee has a project or uh, has to, I'm sorry, not a project has to project one emotion while simultaneously feeling another. So in this emotional labor, this is when you're actually, when you're extending effort to convert or disguise your emotions, um, that's, a, that's a, the dissonance, the difference between the two, the, what you're expressing and what you're feeling. And that's a lot of work. If anybody had to, had to um, you know, change the outward expression of what they're actually feeling, we know that this is an exhausting and it could lead to serious problems in the workplace if it goes on too often, too long. And some people are better at it than other people. So we could say that there's, a, there's, there's emotions that we feel as an individual. So an employee's actual emotions are, uh, are the felt emotions. And this is in contrast to the emotions that are acquired or deemed appropriate. So, you know, in the workplace, it's not appropriate to yell and get angry, although some people will do it. And it's, de and it's usually detrimental to their career. Um, and these are what we call displayed emotions. So there are two levels of displayed emotions that can be expressed. They're both um, appropriately called acting. So surface acting occurs when an employee displays an appropriate emotion, even when he doesn't feel those emotions. Deep acting occurs when the emotion, the employee actually changes their inner feelings to match the displayed results. And this level of acting can be very stressful. And if you're good at, you know, deep emotional acting, then you perhaps could have a good career in acting. Uh, and that's the method actors where actors actually really take on the emotions they're supposed to be feeling and feel them for real. So you can see that in the workplace, some surface acting is required, you know, when you want to hide some of your uh, emotions that aren't appropriate. And deep acting can be, you know, a really difficult, uh, difficult choice if there's something in your job that really bothers you, but you have to change the way you feel about it to be able to maintain the ability to do that job. Uh, so let's look at the AET, which is the Effective Events Theory. So it provides us with 
valuable insights into the role of emotions play in the primary organizational outcomes of job satisfaction, job performance. So how do emotions influence what you do, how you feel about work and how satisfied you are? Well, this effective events theory employee, empl says that employees react emotionally to things that happen to them at work and this reaction influences how they perform their job or their satisfaction. And this is to us, this is how we label it in organizational behavior research, but to us in general, this is common sense. So if you're at work and something's upsetting you, you may not be able to perform very well. So if you're experiencing negative emotions at work, this will definitely hinder your ability to work efficiently and also lower your job satisfaction. Of course, the opposite is true is that if you are feeling really good at work, experience good emotions, then that will help you to enjoy your job better, perform at a higher level and have a higher job satisfaction. Now, if we look at this um, <clears throat> chart here, so work events trigger positive and negative emotional reactions to which employees, um, personalities and moods predispose them to respond with greater or lesser intensity. So emotions influence the performance and satisfaction uh, variables such as uh, organizational citizenship behavior, organizational commitment, level of effort, intent to quit, and workplace uh, deviance. Uh, and then these, so basically we have the work environment that translate into work events. Uh, you have your, your personality, and then that will result in emotional reactions, positive and negative, that's going to affect your job performance or your satisfaction. Okay, so let's uh, talk about emotional intelligence, sometimes called EI. So emotional intelligence is a growing area of study and becoming increasingly important to understanding how individuals behave. Emotional intelligence is pulling in one's understanding of emotions and their impact on behavior. So individuals who are emotionally intelligent will have a strong sense of self-awareness, recognizing their own emotions when they're experienced. They are also able to detect emotions of others, so sort of empathic in nature. By understanding their own emotions and those of others, they can better manage emotional clues and information to make decisions. So emotional intelligence is really, first and foremost, it's owning your emotions and moods and understanding what's causing them. So if you have a high self-awareness, you it helps you to have a better emotional intelligence to decipher and understand why you're feeling your moods and, and emotions. And then if you're able to interpret other people's moods and emotions, even when they're doing, trying to hide their moods and emotions, if you better have a better understanding of that they are, the emotions or moods other people are having, and interpret these emotions and even hopefully put a causality to them, you'll be a more effective manager employee and perform much higher in the workplace. Now, the, if we look at this cascading model of emotional intelligence, people who know their own emotions are good at reading emotional cl clues are, are gonna be more effective. So they're gonna be able to perceive emotions in themselves and others more effectively. They'll be able, the cognitive side, they'll be able to understand the meaning of the emotions and the emotional stability, they'll be better able to regulate their emotions. So if they start getting upset about something, they could realize this is what I'm upset about and this is what I need to do to fix the situation so I'm not upset. So therefore, I know that a solution is coming, I don't have to be upset right now. It's sort of like the emotional intelligence response one could have if they have a good cognitive ability to recognize and understand it and manage emotions. So if we think about emotional intelligence, there's a lot of research and discussion in this area and it's quite an interesting thing. So uh, emotional intelligence plays an important role in, of course, in job performance. However, the jury is out still on the role of emotional intelligence in effectiveness in organizations. The case for emotional intelligence is based on the fact that it makes sense and appeals to our uh, intuitive thinking. So this, all this line of this of of what I've been talking about here, should make sense to you. Uh, it tends to predict things that matter and are positively correlated to high job performance. Many, much research and many studies have shown that emotional intelligence is neurologically based and therefore helpful in predicting behavior. However, emotional intelligence has its critics 
and the concepts can be seen as too vague or not easy to be measured or research. And since it's closely related to intelligence and personality theories, it is not seen as unique when those factors are controlled. So I guess the case for it is that everybody understands that this makes sense and emotions play a big part of performance and success in the, in the workplace. But the case against it is it's really difficult to manage and to judge people's emotions and to, and to measure the emotions so you could research and produce uh, definite facts upon it. Okay. So emotional regulation. So what is this? This is basically what you identify your emotion you're feeling and you modify the emotion on um, the way you feel. So uh, emotional regulation involves identifying and modifying the emotions you feel. Research on effective emotion regulation techniques are ongoing, but studies show that acknowledging rather than suppressing our emotional responses to situations and revealing events after they occur can be effective, as can expression of emotions or venting. So basically, you know, we do this emotional regulations where we feel these emotions, but we regulate um, our responses to them. So, and it could be healthy if you have all these intense emotions that you know the, the proper place to express them, to vent them, uh, where the proper, you know, the, the proper place to have the emotional response to the situation. You know, for example, we, we've all been in situations where we want to cry, but right now, it's not appropriate to cry in this situation, so we may actually go home and cry at a later point, or we may try to uh, modify the way we're feeling to kind of talk ourselves out of an emotion through rational thinking, you know, or sometimes it just helps that the emotions bottle up and we have to vent it out and express it to uh, somebody, you know, and if it not always, it may not always be the person that you want to, but sometimes it's helpful to talk to a therapist or a friend to really be able to express these emotions you have and having someone to listen to what you're saying and what you're feeling to help validate your emotions is very important for maintaining um, appropriate behavior and responses at work and maintaining your emotional health as well. So if, um, if we look at the OB applications to emotions and moods, the um, one is, you know, there are numerous applications, of course, to emotions and moods, and these can include selection of employees, decision making, creativity. So selection, employee, you know, before you hire someone, you should consider someone's emotional intelligence as a factor. And there are certain tests or interview techniques that you could do to kind of get someone's emotional intelligence. Uh, decision making, uh, positive emotions can increase uh, problem solving skills. So understanding uh, and analyzing information in a positive way and helping people to be in a positive move when faced with tough decisions will lead them to be making better decisions. And creativity, people who are in better moves Research has shown that they are better at being creative and providing feedback and improving the creative process. So that's why um, if we can have a, a work environment that fosters positive attitudes and emotions and moods, people will be more creative as well as more productive. Now, if we look at motivation, uh, if a company promotes positive moods through its uh, environment, its culture, its social activities, its fairness in dealing with employees, that motivation will translate into more productive employees. Uh, as far as leadership is concerned, emotions help to convey messages more effectively as a leader. So as a leader, so if leaders who uh, can incorporate emotions into the delivery of their leadership are sometimes more well received. Uh, negotiation, emotions definitely impair negotiation performance. People who are too personally invested in a negotiation, people who are too emotional during a negotiation can have mostly negative effects, sometimes more positive effects, but negotiations are definitely affected by moods and emotions, as is customer service. So um, customers will feel the mood or the energy of employees, and there's this something called emotional contagion where this can be spread from the employees to the customer. So if a customer comes in and needs some customer service and the employee is cranky or in a bad mood or is rude, the customer is going to pick up on this and have a negative outlook on the business or service. So that's why it's very important that, you know, point to contact with customers that these employees can do some, um, can regulate their emotions some. 
and can do a little light acting in expressing friendliness, happiness, cooperativeness, and you know, uh, create an environment where the customer will be satisfied, uh, even though you're you may be delivering some news the customer may, may not like. Delivering with a smile or some consideration or some sympathy definitely goes a long way to the customer accepting it and feeling good about the corporation. You know, job attitudes is a big area uh, as far as you know, um, job ad, uh, attitudes can influence our life at home, uh, but it's not always carried back to, to um, the workplace. So there is a transfer of emotions between home and the workplace. However, deviant workplace behavior are often the result of negative emotions and significantly impact the workplace. So negative emotions can lead to increased injuries at work, increased upsetment. So definitely moods and emotions are tied to your job attitudes. Um, now, deviant work behavior, people who are very negative and are going around gossiping or spreading rumors or being destructive because they have these negative upset emotions, maybe they didn't get the, didn't get the promotion they wanted, they felt their raise was unfair, they felt they were being treated unfairly. And instead of expressing these emotions and working towards a solution or understanding of what's happening, they they become passive aggressive or active aggressive and create a negative, a hostile work environment because they're really don't know they're not dealing with their emotions properly and this could lead to safety or injury at work where emotions you know the first thing the worst driver is a very upset or emotional driver and you know and these has been proven that emotions can affect your ability to be safe now as far as implications for managers recognizing you know uh, moods and emotions are important uh, specifically in the workplace and their importance um, to the study of organizational behavior. Uh, and they're also a natural expression and managers should not try to completely control the employee's emotions or their emotions, but they should be aware of emotions and not ignorant of emotional indicators. So the more you understand the emotions of your employees, the better you'll be able to predict their behavior. So what managers should do is recognize that emotions are part of the workplace and that they're an important source of information about what's happening. And you shouldn't strive or encourage people to hide their emotions, but you should encourage people to express their emotions in a positive, constructive manner. So you want to, managers need to create a uh, creative environment. They want, they want to have an environment where there's creativity, decision making, um, and motivation employees can can all be seen through their positive emotions and in, in, encouraged. Now, in the service sector, display of emotion, especially at the customer level, needs to feel more positive, more supportive, more empathetic. Uh, so customer service reactions or employees dealing with customers needs should have special training and should have special dialogue between uh, managers and these people to understand how to treat a customer. Some people naturally know how to treat a customer, other people who are dealing with customers need to know what's proper, what's right and wrong, and, and examples of how to properly, and we've all been on the, the bad side of customer service, and some of us have been on, you know, been a customer service representative who, who have treated customers beha badly because you're just sick of that same question every time, or you're sick of dealing with the other people's attitudes, and that's that's not your profession, and if you feel that way, if, you're hard, if you have a hard time managing your, regulate your emotions as a customer service, uh, represented in any fashion, maybe that's not the job for you. So managers really need to understand the role of emotions uh, and how that's going to improve their ability to uh, explain and predict the behavior employees to hopefully make a better work environment. And a more productive work environment and organizational culture will lead to a more successful company and a more profitable company. Okay, so that's it for chapter four. I hope you enjoyed this chapter and I'll see you again soon for chapter five.